it's finally happened. Now that I've had a couple of weeks to take in the ending of the Rebirth game and really think about what that means for part three and the overall message that it's trying to tell. I present to you this video. The live stream holds the key to the entire world of Final Fantasy VII. It is part of the makeup of every living thing on the planet, including the spiritual energy and the memories of those that have passed on. What I want to show here to really drive that point home is a clip from Cosmo Canyon. So my parents are no longer with us here, that is, but I believe they're still out there on another plane. I've been reading a bunch of theories about this alternate world in the hope of going there someday. And over the course of my studies, I stumbled across a fascinating theory. It addressed the issue of what the live stream is, arguing that spiritual energy is actually a manifestation of our knowledge and memories. Like I said, it's a fascinating theory, but it's incomplete. What about our hopes and dreams? We remember those, don't we? So what if spiritual energy doesn't distinguish between our real, lived memories and the unrealized desires buried deep in our hearts? What if coming into contact with that energy allowed us to peer through the looking glass, so to speak? It's just an idea, but I hope to find the truth someday. So this clip really explains what is going on pretty well within the world of Final Fantasy VII and gives some added context towards the ending. The live stream holds the manifestation of thought. Also, the ego, as explained by Livestream Black and Livestream White, written by Kazushige Nojima, it is explained that basically Sephiroth has to maintain his connection to Cloud so that he is not completely absorbed within the live stream. So everything to do with the mental and the spiritual is very important here. Now, it is interesting when the woman says it allows us to peer through the looking glass, so to speak. I believe that's what's going on with Zack in this game. Now, the developers did say that Zack would be part of the mystery of this world and would be explaining the functions of the live stream, basically. That would be his, you know, his role. And so I believe that the live stream represents those manifestations of those hopes and desires of those in the living world, so to speak. Notice how when Aerith passes through that part of the barren wasteland at the end of Remake, where Zack actually passed away, there is a moment in which, you know, there, as Zack describes, there's bullets coming towards him, he's feeling them, and then all of a sudden the wind picks up and just stops the bullets. He survives, he makes it to Midgar with the comatose cloud in tow, and you know, this is a world that is dying as the residents are saying. And our Tifa, our Nanaki, our Barret, and so forth, they're not doing too well. And I think a really good way to describe the current setting that they're in, well, initially there's a chapter in Remake, the one where you go and you have pizza at Jesse's house, and then you, you see her father, who is Mako poisoned. Well, after that segment, Biggs says something to Cloud. Jesse's got a theory about it. Thinks her dad's spirit is stuck now between his body and the heart of the planet. And you know, that was a great way of explaining it that made sense to me with Zack. You know, his spirit is kind of wandering because it, it would make sense. He's, in my view, he's still attached to, let's just say the, the physical world because he still has that connection to Aerith. She's wishing that he would come back to her. And she's also a Cetra. So Cetras are able to commune with the planet and really manifest things stronger than a regular human could. These two planes are connected because when the party is going to the Gi's home, Aerith touches the life stream. When Zack touches her hand, she feels something. She feels something in the life stream speak to her. And, you know, that is another confirmation yet again that we're talking about a different plane and that plane is in the live stream. And that plane holds, again, people's hopes, dreams, and desires about their loved ones. It makes a lot of sense. Zach is drifting along there in a sense, in that river uh, that's constantly flowing. And you may ask, well, what does Biggs have to do with it? What does Marlene have to do with it? When Aerith 
touched Marlene and remake it, and she still had the knowledge of her Cetra abilities before the Whispers took them all, Marlene saw something. Aerith started to have a connection with Marlene. Aerith, as revealed in Traces of Two Past, actually knew X, who was part of the Leaf House, and who was actually Biggs in, in Remake and Rebirth, so she did have a personal connection with Biggs as well. In the dream world, these are all people that are connected to Aerith. They're not just placed there at random. Now at the same time, with it being the live stream, there are things going on there that even Aerith can't help. The rift in the sky that you can see in the ending of Rebirth kind of signifies that scar that the planet has and that you know, people that did not touch the live stream or commune with it, they maybe can't see. Aerith, she can clearly see it. Cloud, he can see it after he's had all this spiritual contact with Aerith and having been inside of her dream world, he has mental fragmentation going on. And it's definitely something that is symbolic of his mental illness at this portion of the game. When it comes to future knowledge and the things that Aerith knows from being an ancient, it was actually already established years ago in the official establishment file for Final Fantasy VII, for instance, that a destiny befitting her ancient heritage lies in store for Aerith. Her words and actions suggest she has foreknowledge of this inescapable fate, perhaps owing to her ancient ability to hear the voices of the planet. Aerith knew that she was probably fated to die or fated to save the planet one way or another, pray for holy. It's just that she wanted to try to change it, and I think that's a great message for the game and one that the developers actually said that they wanted to get across. You know, can you change fate? And it's illustrated in the fact also with Zack in the dream world, in the dream plane, where every time he makes a different decision, every time there's a different fork in the path that he takes, he's still fated to die, no matter if Aerith lets him live a little longer in that dream state, Zack is still fated to die. Aerith too, she gets her wish of spending more time with Cloud in the dream world because she's still mourning Zack, and in the same plane of dreams, Aerith wishes to get to know Cloud more, or at least replicate the experience she had with Zack, which doesn't quite happen, but that's what she wishes for at the moment. But she's still fated to die one way or another. Sephiroth is still going to stalk her in her dream world. And, and why is that? Why can Sephiroth do that well? If you remember from the original game, Cloud essentially killed Sephiroth when he fell into the live stream at the Nibel Mako reactor. But he fell in, absorbed all the knowledge of the ancients, and his real body is encased in Mako in the northern crater. So he's absorbing all of that knowledge. In the meantime, he is essentially flowing through that river of the live stream, you know, entering those plains where Aerith might be or, you know, Tifa might be. Now, does this function in the live stream remind you of any other games written by Kazushige Nojima? Well, yes, there is one in the form of Final Fantasy X with its concepts of the far plane, summoning worlds and characters such as Titus, who is essentially a dreamlike being, with the use of collective thought and will. Kind of sounds like what Aerith is doing with the dream world and what people do with their thoughts in Final Fantasy VII. There is also an interesting tidbit in the Final Fantasy X-2 Ultimania about Shinra, who is related to President Shinra in Final Fantasy VII's world. Nojima states, as a matter of fact, Shinra quits the Gull Wings, receives enormous financial assistance from Rin, and uses Vegna Gun to extract Mako energy from the Far Plane. However, he can't complete the system to utilize the energy in a single generation, and the Shinra Power Company is built on another planet in the future, once travel to distant planets is possible. Those things happen about 1,000 years after this story, though. So it is very clear that the concept of spirit energy is one that underlines a lot of Nojima's writing and a lot of his beliefs. So as I stated similarly in my video about whether Sephiroth and Genova are multidimensional, I do say that, you know, thoughts are powerful. And so it makes sense. They're energy. They're not just meaningless things. They have power, the power of creation. And so it makes sense that Sephiroth would want to absorb all of these things 
uh, all of these energies, coalesce them into one, become a god by using this energy, going on forever as, as he wishes. According to my last video, where I referenced the endless cycle of life, death, and rebirth, which is referred to as samsara and the Buddhist teachings, people are reborn and then die and the cycle repeats. There's an endless cycle of convergence and divergence within this river of life, right? Sephiroth doesn't ever want to end. He, ne he doesn't want to die. And this is of course stated again in Lifestream Black, where he really holds on to that ego, to that id, with this hatred for Cloud. But this is unnatural, and this is unnatural and foreign to the planet. This is not how Mother Nature works in this world. And so Aerith acts as the antithesis to this want, this need. Mother Nature versus Parasite. Aerith represents the last of her race, the Cetra. He is also, quote unquote, the last of his alien race in a sense. He was directly injected as a fetus with Genova cells. He is, in effect, her last living legacy. And boy, are living legacies such a theme in this game. And when we speak about Zack adopting the role that Titus did in Final Fantasy X, it's funny because in the Crisis Core Ultimate to Mania from 2007, it is stated that, quote, Nojima suspects that his image of Zack's character from the original Final Fantasy VII inspired Titus in Final Fantasy X. He says that neither dwells on things too much and both have a clear sense of right and wrong. They suffer and worry when encountering issues they can't adopt a firm position on. They, again, they are adopting the same kind of role in these games. In the Temple of the Ancients during Rebirth, when Sephiroth talks about these errant worlds and how he wants them all to be one again, Aerith does let him know that there's no such thing as forever because Sephiroth wants to be living over all beings. He wants to subsume reality to really create nothing in, in which he is the ruler of all creation. So really it does make sense that again, he would want to absorb that whole river of life that is flowing through this planet that runs opposite to the nature of this planet and the cycle of life, death, and rebirth in general. Because you have to understand a cornerstone of Buddhist teachings and uh, belief systems is that life is not permanent. You know, nothing lasts forever. And this can even be seen when we're talking about our relationships with people. And this is reflected in the whole theme of Final Fantasy VII, which is life. Aerith dies and there's nothing you can do about it. The fact that Remake and Rebirth made some of us think that we could actually save her from her fate, which cannot be changed because it is the will of the planet, the will of existence. It's in a way so genius that they kind of flip it on its head for you in the ending where we think, oh, are we going to save her? Are, are we going to stop Sephiroth's blade? But in the end, she dies. Like, our Aerith dies. When Sephiroth is explaining the true nature of reality to Cloud when they're in the white space, I think this is another moment where we can link back to a concept or philosophy in Buddhism called sunyata, which is the voidness that constitutes ultimate reality. Sunyata is seen not as a negation of existence, but rather as the undifferentiation out of which all apparent entities, distinctions, and dualities arise. From nothing can something be born, and so this is that space in which Sephiroth shows cloud. What is occurring. I would also like to mention the concept of Atman and Brahman as it relates to the philosophy behind Final Fantasy VII. Atman is one of the most basic concepts in Hinduism and Buddhism, the universal self identical with the eternal core of the personality that after death either transmigrates to a new life or attains release from the bonds of existence. Your spirit or your soul in this philosophy definitely becomes eventually part of what is known as the universal Brahman or the universal oneness. Atman is part of the universal Brahman with which it can commune or even fuse. So this definitely is an analogy on the relationship between the Setra and the life stream in Final Fantasy VII as well, because as a Setra, Aerith can commune with the planet 
And this also represents the special link to nature that her people have versus a regular human or someone like Sephiroth, which also ties in to the theme of life within Final Fantasy VII. Zack, every time he breaches fate, is still the same Zack we know and love, right? It's not a different version of Zack. Cloud as well, even when he's in Aerith's dream world, it doesn't mean that it's a separate version of him. It's very much still him, just on a different plane. His mind is in a different plane. Same with Aerith. As she can commune with the voices in the live stream, the planet, it's no wonder that she would show up in that mental space of clouds. I also want to make note that a lot of this spiritual framework that's being laid out is definitely something that someone in Japan would follow versus someone in the Western world. I feel like a lot of the views that fans might have are influenced by Western science fiction or... They might be influenced by the Christian framework, which, which definitely has a different set of beliefs to it. For instance, Eastern religions and philosophies definitely put more of an emphasis on the concept of reincarnation. Whereas, in my experience with Judeo-Christian faiths, it's not as widespread. Saying this, what's interesting to note also about the true nature of reality that is being portrayed is that the characters that appear in the white spaces, which again, is more like a void. In this void, only characters like Aerith and Sephiroth and Zack can truly appear next to Cloud. And, and why is that? Well, I think them being physically dead has something to do with it. And the fact that Genova, whenever you fight her, Genova Life Cleaner, Genova Dreamweaver, Genova Emergent, they pull you into their space, into their illusion when you fight them. It's such a powerful thing because this creature, she or it, never truly died. In fact, when the Setra fought it, as they state in the Temple of the Ancients, she entered a deep sleep. And so it, it makes you wonder if this being as Geno known as Genova can truly die or die in the sense that we know of returning to the planet because obviously she is a foreign body. She cannot return to the planet. So it is hard to truly have her die. But in Advent Children, Kailaj was granted reprieve by Aerith who at that point represented motherly earthly figure when she becomes part of the live stream. So maybe there is possibility for reprieve towards those foreign bodies should someone of ancient heritage accept them within the planet's flow. So what's my take on Aerith's new death scene? When Genova Life Clinger masquerading as Sephiroth strikes down with his blade. It really does look like, to me, it, as if he's already stabbed Aerith underneath him. This is how the shot looks to me. But no matter what, if Sephiroth was already stabbing Aerith or not, it's clear that when the burst of the rainbow comes out signaling the life stream, to me, it definitely does signify Cloud's hope and dream that he, you know, saved Aerith in that moment. And added to the fact that he's unwell right now, really unwell, I think that the moment that she died, which seemed instantaneous to us, she manifested before Cloud in a spiritual form to give him comfort because, again, his mind is not all there. He's experiencing multiple personality disorder and he's also still dealing with headaches and the effects of Mako poisoning. All this to say that Aerith is definitely dead dead. And when Tifa and the rest of the party run in onto the scene, you can see when the perspective shifts to Tifa that they are seeing Cloud holding onto Aerith's dead body. But to Cloud, he's actually speaking with Aerith because technically he is on another plane. But she knows that he's so sensitive and fragile right now that she doesn't want to let him know that, hey, I'm actually dead. When the party starts fighting Sephiroth Reborn or... I mean, Bizarro Sephiroth. It starts with Cloud and Zack, uh, what appears to be the edge of creation. And Zack just pops into the plane that Cloud is on, helping him as a sort of spiritual guide, ally. And it was so awesome to witness. And then Cloud is by himself, but Zack and Cloud are then on different planes. Sephiroth seemingly in his world of Meteor with Zack fighting him on that level. But spiritually, him and Cloud are still shown to be connected. And Cloud is clearly reciting Zack's exact phrasing and line. So that shows you that obviously Cloud is still 
suffering from the Zack syndrome. And then, of course, the rest of the party are also fighting Bizarro Sephiroth in tandem. I think the Whispers are manipulating the different planes, or rather helping Sephiroth to be, ooh, shall I say, multi-dimensional in a sense, uh, with his corruption and with Genova's corruption as well. Finally, Cloud and Aerith get a crack at Sephiroth in another plane. It's clearly Aerith who has been inside the live stream because soon after she holds Cloud's hand, she dissipates once again. And this is definitely a callback from that same scene in Advent Children, where she is also dead. I think that all in all, the message here is that when someone dies, we will grieve, but eventually we need to move on because we can't bring them back. It's also worth noting that the fight with Cloud and Zack, again, mirrors shot for shot the final confrontation at the end of the original Final Fantasy VII, where Cloud and Sephiroth fight in Cloud's psycho-spiritual world. And during the fight with Aerith as your party member, Sephiroth does taunt Cloud and ask him if what they're experiencing right now is even real. A lot of this is a mental battle. A lot of this is an illusion. We just don't quite know what, but I think the overall message is clear in the fact that those who die are permanently dead. And Tatsuya Nomura did say that the characters that are dead are going to stay dead. Uh, even in the remake trilogy, they're not going to change anything, especially since it's going to line up with Advent Children. So it wouldn't make sense to change the whole story like that. I believe that it's still lining up for the most part with the original game and the compilation, just with minor tweaks and changes, but the overall message still remains. If you like this video about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, feel free to check out my other ones, and more is on the way. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you so much, and this has been Tana Greek Nose, over and out.